The Nightmare of Adolescent Mental Health Care, One Girl's Story. This is the story of one girl's journey through the nightmare of adolescent mental health care. It is a true story, read by an actor, but all the names have been changed. Chapter 1. In the Beginning. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. Once upon a time there was a little girl who lived with her mummy and daddy and baby brother in a cottage in the country. They had a silly dog and a fluffy cat. The little girl liked them very much. She was a soft-hearted little girl who cared very deeply for all animals. She liked the tweenies, especially Fizz. She had a Fizz costume and would dress up as Fizz and dance along with the tweenie songs. She loved singing and knew how to do the actions to just about every single nursery rhyme. She was very, very loved. She had lots of dreams. She wanted to be a singer when she grew up and to have a big family because she loved children. She wanted to be a nurse or a doctor. She couldn't wait for her big prom when she was 16. She knew she would look like a fairy princess. Chapter 2. The dreams begin to crumble. Mummy and Daddy began to argue a lot, and when the little girl was ten, Daddy moved out. He very rarely saw the little girl after this. She was very hurt. Mummy was very unhappy during this time and wasn't really there for the little girl. It was extra hard for the little girl and her brother because the family had no other relatives and no one to help and support them. Her little brother was very unhappy and the little girl did all she could to comfort him. The little girl felt lonely. The little girl had always done very well at school and was an A student. Every parent's evening, her parents had proudly listened to her teachers say how well she was doing. But now, the little girl started to have difficulties at school. There was no one to really understand why. Chapter 3. Struggling. When the little girl went to secondary school, she felt scared and overwhelmed, but she didn't tell anyone. She had stopped telling anyone how she felt. She told everyone she was fine and had no problems. Instead, she helped everyone else with their problems. But she started to have very difficult feelings and unusual thoughts. One night, she went to her mum and said she had done something silly and didn't know why. She showed her mum her arm that was littered with cuts. Her mum was very upset and frightened, but the little girl promised her she would never do it again. She could not keep her promise. Chapter 4. Asking for help. The little girl's mum contacted the school and shared her concerns. The school thought that the little girl was just behaving badly. The little girl's mum asked the school for support and the little girl started to see a family support worker and then the school counsellor. The little girl didn't like seeing the counsellor because she would walk into the little girl's class to ask her and the little girl hated her friends knowing that she had problems. The little girl was still having very difficult feelings and unusual thoughts. Her behaviour was becoming hard for her mum to understand. The little girl was self-harming regularly and had started losing a lot of weight. She stayed in her room most of the time and didn't want to spend any time with her family. Her mum was now very worried and went everywhere she could think of asking for help. She found a private counsellor for the little girl to see. This was helpful and the little girl liked her counsellor but didn't tell her the truth about her difficult feelings and unusual thoughts. The family support worker thought the little girl was depressed and made a referral to the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, otherwise known as CAMS. The little girl saw a support worker at CAMS, but was discharged very soon after because the little girl had said she was feeling better. The little girl's mum knew this wasn't true. This was a very difficult time for all the family. The mum felt blamed and angry with services that didn't believe her when she told them about her daughter's difficult feelings and unusual thoughts. 
the mum continued to ask for help despite feeling judged and blamed. The family went to see a family therapist at CAMS. The therapy sessions were very haphazard. It wasn't helpful, but the mum didn't know where else to go and the problems continued. Then the family had a big house fire. It started in the little girl's room when a candle flame caught hold of the curtains. The house was very badly damaged by the fire. The family lost their home and most of their possessions. Chapter 5 Begging for help. After the fire, the family moved from one temporary place to another whilst their home was being restored. It was a terrible time. The little girl was desperate but had no voice. She started having awful memories about things that had happened to her when she was a very little girl. Thoughts she could never, ever tell anyone. The little girl and her mum went back to family therapy and the therapist said that the little girl was on the autistic spectrum, gave lots of information and didn't make another appointment. This diagnosis was never confirmed and left the little girl feeling very unhappy and misunderstood. The little girl's mum went to see another person at CAMS but felt judged and blamed and left feeling even more desperate and like the very worst mother in the world. She just couldn't find support for her daughter and couldn't work out why professionals seemed unsupportive to her as a mother. Her confidence dropped and she felt humiliated and disempowered. She was the only person her daughter had. Surely it would make more sense to affirm her role and build confidence and strength so that the mother could care for the little girl and keep her safe. The little girl's mum didn't understand. The little girl's mum found another private counsellor for her daughter. The little girl went to see the counsellor but didn't tell her about her terrible fears, pain and the thoughts that were becoming more and more unusual. The mum knew her daughter. She knew her behaviours and knew if she was safe or unsafe. But she could not get anyone to listen to her. The mum knew that the little girl was a very high risk to herself and was very frightened that the little girl would try and kill herself. The little girl's school was very concerned. One day the school phoned to say that the little girl had told her friends she was going to kill herself and they were very worried. The little girl had left a note in her room for her mum saying that she loved her but she couldn't carry on living. Her mum managed to find her and bring her home, but the little girl was angry and hid away in her room, refusing to speak to anyone. Once again, her mum rang the family therapist at CAMS with these concerns. She went to meet with him and told all her concerns. She never heard back. Then, a carer support worker called Joanne started to visit. For the first time, the little girl's mum felt that someone was on her side. When all the fire damage to the family home had been repaired, they moved back in. This was very difficult for them all. The little girl's mum again told Cams about her concerns. Soon after, the little girl took a huge overdose and was rushed to hospital. It was a serious suicide attempt, not a cry for help. The little girl didn't want to live. Her mum once again left a message with the family therapist telling him what had happened. He never replied. Joanne's ongoing support was a great help at this time, but the little girl's mum felt hope slipping away. Chapter 6 Help at Last Whilst in the hospital following the overdose, the little girl was visited by another person from CAMS. She was a psychologist and her name was Jill. Jill was very worried about the little girl and arranged for her to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist was called Abby. Jill and Abby listened very carefully to the little girl. They didn't believe her words. They listened instead to her pain and her fear and the little girl slowly began to talk about her difficult feelings and unusual thoughts. 
Abby and Jill built up a very special relationship with the little girl. They were reliable and consistent and worked hard to understand. They believed that the little girl had a mood disorder and had been through a lot of trauma. Not only were Jill and Abby there for the little girl, they were also there for her mum. Her mum called them with her worries and concerns about the little girl's deep feelings and unusual thoughts. They were always there. Joanne, the carer support worker, visited the house often to support the mum and the little girl's brother. She listened and affirmed and understood. The family didn't feel alone anymore. If this were a fairy story, it would end here. But it's not a fairy story, and there isn't always a happy ever after. The little girl opened up more and more to Jill and Abby, but there were some things she just couldn't say. An awful thing that she only part remembered. She had flashbacks and awful nightmares and memories that were hard to make sense of and understand. Something very bad had happened to her. Something she just couldn't tell anyone. The little girl felt guilty and bad. Her unusual thoughts became more unusual and Jill and Abby felt that she needed to be in hospital for a little while. It was hard to keep her safe at home because the little girl really wanted to die. She just couldn't cope with the awful feelings and memories. The little girl went into hospital. The only one available was a long way away. In hospital, the little girl didn't know the doctors, nurses and healthcare assistants and found it hard to talk. She would sit in the corridor for hours, just crying. The little girl's unusual thoughts were becoming even more unusual and she saw and heard things that weren't really there. The little girl's mum was becoming aware that perhaps something awful had happened to her daughter and she looked through the little girl's belongings and computer. She did not feel good about doing this, but there was a piece of a jigsaw missing and she wanted to find it. She found things on the computer. There are no words to describe how the little girl's mum felt when she saw the things that the little girl had written about. Things that had happened when she was very small. The little girl's mum told Cams what she had found. They were very supportive, but said that the little girl had to find her own voice in order to heal. The little girl left hospital and the family continued to be supported by Abby, Jill and Joanne. Other professionals also began to offer support. Although the little girl was still very poorly, the support was in place to keep her safe. The little girl's mum felt supported and understood too. The little girl began to really trust Jill and Abby and although she couldn't say exactly what, she did tell Jill that there was something awful she couldn't talk about. Chapter 7 – Dark Times The little girl's moods became more extreme. Sometimes her mood was very low and she wanted to harm herself. Other times her mood became very high and she became disinhibited, doing things she felt very ashamed of afterwards. At times she continued to see and hear things that weren't there and became very frightened and paranoid. She had delusions that she had to do certain things and once again had to go into hospital. The hospital was over 150 miles away from the little girl's home but was the only available adolescent bed in the entire country. It was a private hospital. There were no available NHS beds anywhere in the country. The nightmare began to worsen. The little girl was very poorly. She saw and heard terrible things. Dead people screaming at her. People she loved being murdered and someone trying to get her and hurt her and kill her. She was petrified. On the ward there was a psychiatrist, nurses, healthcare assistants, a psychologist and a family therapist. The little girl's mum tried very hard to communicate with the staff. 
to tell them about her daughter and what the little girl needed. They didn't listen. There was a shortage of staff and often many of the staff on duty were from an agency and did not know the very ill young people on the ward. They seemed to have very few of the skills and qualities needed to work with them. One day, another patient hit the little girl in the face. The little girl's mum asked for an investigation and was told the little girl had provoked the person who hit her, which seemed to suggest it was her fault. It was not her fault. It had never, ever been her fault. The little girl became more and more distressed after this. The staff started to put their hands on the little girl. They restrained her, held her down and injected her with antipsychotic drugs. The little girl could not bear to be touched. Her mum had told staff this over and over again. They did not listen. The little girl's mum rang the ward following hysterical calls from her daughter. On one occasion, the nurse on duty shouted at the mother that her daughter wasn't the only one on the ward and they were too busy to check on her. The little girl's mum complained. No one listened. The little girl did build a good relationship with a healthcare assistant called John. He understood the little girl and she was never restrained or forcibly injected whilst he was on duty. He knew just to be with her and listen and tell her over and over that she was safe. The little girl began to talk about her awful secrets. In tiny baby steps, she began to talk about what had happened when she was a tiny child. The hospital involved other agencies without telling the little girl. She became terrified that bad things would happen because she'd begun to open up about what she called her deepest, darkest secrets. She became even more distressed. The little girl was taken forcibly to a high dependency ward in the same hospital. She was not allowed to see John, who she'd begun to trust. She stopped talking. An investigation involving the police began, but it stopped because the little girl had lost her voice again. The little girl's mum slept in her car in the hospital car park. She wanted to be there in order to try and prevent the staff using physical restraint and forced medication when her daughter became distraught and terrified. A friend of the little girl's mum also tried to visit regularly. When they were there, the little girl didn't need to be restrained. The little girl began to have terrible episodes of distress. She would scream and become hysterical, having terrible thoughts and memories. She would hurt herself and scratch until she bled. She stopped showering and broke her front tooth. She wasn't taken to a dentist for many weeks because the hospital said they couldn't find one. Her mum was shocked, having herself been restrained and forcibly injected in a psychiatric hospital over 30 years before, when she was young. She couldn't believe that nothing, nothing had changed, and that people were still restrained and injected against their will, re-traumatising the already traumatised, vulnerable and fragile. The staff did not have the skills, knowledge and qualities to deal with and support these young people without resorting to such archaic methods. The little girl was frightened to cry because she would be given medication to stop her crying. She was given medication to sleep, to calm her down, to stop her feeling completely. She felt dead inside. There was no one to simply sit with the little girl and hear her feelings. No one to just sit with her distress and let the little girl know that she was safe and cared for. The little girl just needed someone to let her know that her feelings were okay. But each time the professionals medicated or distracted or restrained. This communicated to the little girl that her feelings were too much for them to handle. All she really needed was acceptance and understanding. 
The little girl told her mum that they restrained her cruelly, and when she screamed and struggled, one member of staff had laughed at her. Other times she was ignored. One member of staff had said they weren't paid enough to manage her. The little girl's mum relayed all this to the hospital management. She felt ignored and treated like a troublemaker. She wanted to discharge her daughter, but the little girl was formally detained under the Mental Health Act. Abby and Jill from CAMS were there in the background and were shocked and appalled at what was happening. They made a complaint about what was happening at the hospital. The little girl was discharged very suddenly. Chapter 8 Professionals that went the extra mile Jill and Abby again stepped in and did everything possible to support the little girl and her family. As a community service, they had few resources, but were always there to help and support. The little girl began to heal. It took a long time to talk through the trauma of her last hospital admission. Jill left to have a baby and another psychologist called Sharon took her place. She worked very hard to build trust with the little girl and put lots of support in place for her and her family. Joanne was still there for her mum, fighting in her corner, seeking additional support, writing emails and just listening when there were no more words to say. The community service was massively stretched. So many young people in distress, few resources, few well-trained staff. The little girl did continue to heal with help from Abby, Sharon and others who came to care. However, the memories from when she was very small haunted her. The little girl became very unwell and unsafe again and had to go back into hospital. This was terrifying for the little girl and her family due to past experiences. The little girl went to an NHS unit 30 minutes from home. She was very unwell and had awful delusions and hallucinations. She harmed herself and hit out in her terror and distress. The staff sat with her. They did not put their hands on her. They did not force medication on her. They tried hard to listen and understand. The little girl began to talk about what happened to her as a young child, but the hospital was only for young people who were very ill and in crisis. There just wasn't enough time for the little girl to tell the whole story. The little girl was discharged from hospital. She still has a very long way to go. Chapter 9 Where she is now She doesn't wash. She cannot sleep in a bed and her anxiety is so high she cannot go out alone. She is terrified of the dark and stays awake throughout the night. She curls up in a chair most of the day. She can get very angry and destructive in her fear and frustration. She is terrified of the shower. She still cannot bring herself to say who it was that hurt her all those years ago. She has not been to school for three years. Her friends have disappeared. She had no prom. She has no career. Her dreams are still only dreams that she believes will never come true. The little girl is so sad. She wants to be like other young people of her age. Abby has left the child and adolescent mental health services. Sharon and Joanne are still helping the family. They are working so hard to try and build a team to help the little girl, but there are simply not the resources needed. The little girl may not need to be in hospital but she is certainly not able to manage in the community. The little girl's mum does not know what to do or where to go next to get the support the little girl desperately needs in order to avoid yet another hospital admission. The little girl's mother is exhausted from fighting to get her daughter the care she needs. She feels humiliated and battered by some of the services that are meant to be supporting the family. The little girl curls up in a chair, sucking her thumb. The end. This story 
has been the author's account and should not necessarily be taken as a reflection of the views of the counselling channel. It has been read by Angela Laverick and produced by the counselling channel.